of the fasting. It wasn't, it wasn't. What it was is, it was that God is not in a box. And that uh, there are things that may be good, but the uh, John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples came to him and uh, said to him, um, you know, how, how come you're not fasting Jesus? And what he was really saying is, he gave them some answers, and we'll come back to that. And there was, uh, but he said, there's, there's reasons to fast that are really important. And uh, so the focus of the fast is really a big deal. And he talked about that he was the bridegroom and that they were, um, his disciples were celebrating a wedding with him. That Jesus had come. The Messiah was here. I, I talked about what are our reasons, uh, the Old Testament reasons for fast. Longing for a redeemer. They were fasting because they were waiting for their Messiah to come and rescue them. Uh, I'm, I'm in that place right now that I'm waiting for Jesus to come on the scene and do a rescue in this nation. And then, so they were praying, Messiah, please come and redeem Jerusalem. And then they were praying for the nation's sins. Do you think that we should be praying for the sins of our nation right now? We are in shape, we are in a shape that is horrendous in this time. And then they were praying for God's presence. Oh Lord, pour out your presence on us. There were when, when they when they did not feel the Lord's presence right there, they became uncomfortable. And and they be, be, began to cry out. Somehow, you know, when we sing the songs, He is the air I breathe, or you're the breath in my lungs. Let me tell you something. If you've ever had an experience where suddenly you couldn't breathe, have you ever had that? And you just couldn't get your breath and you really began to panic. Uh, I had that happen one time on Clearwater Beach. I had gone on a long run. I sat down and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. I couldn't even take a breath. And I was just panicking. And there was a, there was a sheriff's tent and things working. They were doing exercises. And I saw these rescue squad and sheriffs and... And I started to try to make my way, you know. And I'm trying to say I can't breathe. And they thought I was messing around with them. Because they were out there and they thought, here this guy is playing with us. Finally they realized. And anyway, they got me settled down. And, but I'm going to tell you something. It was a scary moment. I thought, I'm going to die. I can't get a breath. Isn't it something, wouldn't it be something that if he's the breath in my lungs that when I don't feel him moving in me, that I would be that desperate, oh God, I can't, I can't go another day without your presence, your breath in my lungs, your excitement in me. And so that's what they prayed for. And they also were coming on the promises of God. He had promised them so much and they weren't seeing it. And so he was, they were, would cry out, God, You've given us a promise, and we're longing for your promise to come. They waited 400 years from the last prophet in the Old Testament. 400 years they're waiting for these, this Messiah to come, and nothing had happened. Did you know there was silence in those 400 years? There was no prophet in the land until Jesus hit the scene. And so they prayed for that. Now Jesus' reasons for fasting were a little bit different. Jesus' reasons for fasting was he went out into the wilderness to conquer the enemy, to beat the enemy. That's a good reason to fast. And also to destroy demon activity in the lives of people. And we've got plenty of that. And that was why he went out to fast. He himself said, there are some things that are not going to happen in your life or in your home or in your family without prayer and fasting. Did you hear me? Some things, he said, there are some spirits that are operating in your family, in your home, in your life, and in our society that are not going to come out except by prayer and fasting. His word doesn't change. And so, uh, Jesus' reasons for fasting. Our goal of fasting is this, that we want to line up, and I want you to reflect on this, what might be your reasons for fasting? Not as a ritual. And when I say fasting, I'm not even just talking food. I told you that. What Our reasons for fast, our goal is this. We line up our body and even our mind and our feelings with something that is lacking in our life. And here's, here's what it is. Oh God, I need to see you save one of my children. You have got to bring salvation to one of my children or one of my grandchildren that is so lost. And I have those, okay? And, and why did they fast? 
Why did they give up something? Because he had put them in tune. If they're empty of a, pr a promise they're seeking from God, they wanted to empty themselves of something that they wanted so bad. Food became the big one. I'll go without a meal, and then my, when my stomach growls, I'll cry out to you, God, for an answer to this prayer. I want to empty myself physically, and I want to feel that I'm lacking something because I am lacking something. I'm desperate for you to answer a prayer. Wouldn't you like to see people saved and find Jesus for the first time in their life that have never heard? We have songs like, I love to tell the story, or tell me the old, old story, and some have never heard it in this country. They've never heard it. They, are, they don't know any Bible stories that you grew up with. And they don't know the good news. So I just ask, are your reasons for fasting? Is there something, is there someone that is so desperately in need that maybe you're fasting something? Would actually bring, what if it would? What if the sacrifice that you made would bring someone to know Jesus Christ. And what if you counted on the promises of God and a spirit that is destroying someone you love would come out because you are praying and fasting. And don't think it's crazy because one man, one father, for 25 years fasted two meals a day to get his son saved. 25 years. His son got saved. It became very well known. It was in a great gospel quartet that he was going to do that until his son was saved, and it took 25 years. I'm not suggesting that, and I know I, I know that there are other ways to do things, but what might be the reason? So religion challenges Jesus. They come up in Mark 2:18. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and asked him, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but yours do not? He goes on to say, the wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. So they're challenging Jesus. Here was the requirement, the requirement to fast. Okay, I want to talk requirements versus relationship. The requirement for fasting was one day per year on the Day of Atonement. That's all it was. But they had taken that requirement and, well-meaning, they turned it into a rule. And then it became fast twice a week. And then it became that you are probably better off than somebody else if you fast twice a week and they don't. So it became an arrogance. But it was only required once a year, and they turned it into a rule twice a week, and then they bragged about it. I don't want to fast that we brag about. <laughs> so they had challenged Jesus, and, and the requirements they had put on were above what was even required. But Jesus <laughs> challenged them back. If you were to look at Matthew 6, Jesus challenges religious spirits. I want to tell you something. Jesus is a challenge to religion when religion is formed without godliness. Jesus will challenge it. And so he, here's what he says. Be careful, verse 1, Matthew 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whatever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. So Jesus said, here is what you're doing with your, your, your worship at times. <laughs> if you can imagine this, before they were going to give in the offering, or if they were going to do something, they had a trumpet go before them to announce. I mean, just try to imagine this. Okay, that's beautiful, wasn't it? So they, they blow a trumpet. And then they put their offering in. They use the trumpet to get the crowd. See what I'm doing? That's not. That's not what we're about. So Jesus says, you know what your problem is? You're fasting and you're tithing and you never miss church. But he said, you're doing it to be seen of men. 
and for applause. Now, I know that's not why we meet here. I know that. But we, we've got a different church than that, don't we? We meet because we want to be in the presence of God, don't we? We want to hear from the Holy Spirit. We have something going on in our lives that we need transformed. And we're saying, I'm going to be in the presence of the people of God, and I'm going to have God move in my life. There are some here today, I'm going to tell you, if you'll stop and say, what does God want to do in my life? There are things that are out of order in your life today. I mean, you're on the road, but God wants to do much more. I want to tell you, you know what repentance is? It's getting a new way of thinking. It's not confession. That follows, that follows repentance. When, you're, when your mind has to turn around, metanoia, your mind just turns around and says, I need a new way of thinking. And I'm going to tell you what it is for many of us who know the Lord. We need a new way of thinking. New wine is here. Jesus ends up talking about fasting and we'll go into our passage. He says, you know what? No one takes a new patch and puts it on an old garment. We'll come back to that. And no one takes new wine and puts it into old bottles. And Jesus is saying, you need a new way of thinking, religious folks. You need to get a new way of thinking about God and who you are and, and what he can do in your life. He is not some Amazon order and you hope you get something done cheaper or you hope you find something that you want. He is the one who speaks and worlds are formed and he can call in things into your life that do not exist right now. From Romans 4, Abraham believed God. The God who part of the Red Sea, it says in that passage, who could call into place things that never were. We need that, don't we? Okay, so Jesus, he ends up saying, I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you, churches. I'm challenging you, religious ones. I'm challenging you that the best of the Spirit is here. New wine is here. Wine was representative of the Holy Spirit. He said, new wine is here. And here's what he says. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. Jesus, I started with this. He will not put new wine into old wineskins. Do you know what that means? If he's doing something new, we need to be reshaped and renewed and we need a new wineskin to handle it. He said, you know what will happen? Because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the pressure of that is going to break the mold. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning, we could talk about the good old days. And, and there are things that I, I do, you know, I miss about that because I'm old and so I remember the good old days. And, and there's comfortable things in that. And I love thinking about the camp meetings and, and all the stuff that was so great back then and going to camp. But new wine is not about the good old days or the good new days. New wine is about getting into a pattern or a mold. Do you want to know something? Old wineskins can be modern church today. I mean, it can be modern church. Do you know what? We can go to conferences all the time that tell us, if we'll just get this kind of praise band and this kind of foyer with this kind of food, and pastor, if you'll sit on a stool and wear skinny jeans with, you know, threadbare and, and look modern, we'll get the young crowd if you'll do that. Now, I, I have some jeans that are slim, but there's a whole reason for that. But me sitting in skinny jeans is not going to draw a crowd. It's going to probably lose a crowd. You don't, you don't, you don't have to laugh so hard. You don't, um, right now, we look at all the churches that are big and successful and we go, well, you know, I think that's what we need to do. No, that's old wineskins. We don't need we don't need to find out what other people are doing and then do it. We need to hear what God is saying and then do it. Right. We need to know what God is doing and we need to be in His mold and not other people's molds. We don't need to copy anybody. We need Christ to come down in our lives and do a work in us. We need to think so far out of the box because God doesn't even have a box. How are we going to do it? 
What are we going to do? What's going to grow us? What's going to change our lives? What's going to take the sin that is conquering us away so that we have power in the blood of Christ? New wine, new things of the Holy Spirit. Old vessels can't contain, they get rigid. And I'm going to tell you, I've seen it. Oh, I can remember some scenes in church. Oh my goodness. I went in and I was singing. I came in and I was holding a revival. Frankly, one of them was in Steve Hoffman's church as a youth. Way back, Russell Avenue. And I came in and I was early and I was setting up my music equipment. And it was stuff like Lori and I sing. And it was this, you know, background tapes. And I'm singing. And the crowd isn't, the service is an hour away. But there was this person there. This old person, probably wasn't old at all, but to me it looked old. And this person goes, we don't do that kind of music in this church. I thought, what? A really angry person. And then I thought, well, I'll turn it down. Well, thanks for turning it down, but you better have some other songs. Well, now that's not the way most of the church felt. But this person, this was Bill Gaither stuff. You see, now that's just like old hat. That's like old worship hymns. And now and we don't like the new music. Well, whatever. I'm just saying. To each generation, there's things that we like and we're comfortable with, and, and that's me. I mean, if you're in my home and I go to YouTube, it's probably not going to be your kind of music, young folks. But the reality is, that doesn't make my wine skin or yours better. We God is not in your box or mine. God wants to do more and bigger than any of us can imagine. And he's saying, you realize, you Pharisees, the problem that you're having is you've trapped yourself into what you can do to impress people. See, I don't have, I don't have any more ideas on how to impress people. I mean, I'm too old to impress people. If I can't do it by now, I'm just too old for it. But I need a Christ in me that can impress people with what God can do. The God who spoke the universe into place can speak into their broken hearts and lives and homes and change them. Come Holy Spirit. I need you. Come Holy Spirit. I pray. I'm asking even right now, in a very reverent moment. I'm not, that's not a song I'm trying to sing. Come on. Come, Holy Spirit. Like a burning bush. Like a flame. Come. Come into our presence. We need you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come. <clears throat> We're going to go outside of the box right now at this time. I want you to listen to me very carefully. We have people listening online, and we have one, and I'm going to speak to her. I want to welcome you. Her name is Jackie. She waits for every service of ours and she says, Jackie, you've said to us, there's all kinds of things to watch, but your service is touching me more than any one of them. Did you hear that, folks? Yes. She cannot get out of the house. She is homebound. The list of illnesses, maybe it's not important, maybe it is, but I want you to know she doesn't get out, but she doesn't miss a single post of ours or a single sermon or a single clip. She's more faithful than most anybody would ever be that attends a church. Fibromyalgia, mm. two types of neuropathy, degenerative neck and back disease, mm. chronic bilateral sciatica, scoliosis. She lives in pain day by day. Jackie, we've been praying for you, but I'm going to do something this morning. 
I said to Jackie, you you feel like uh, sometimes more a part of my church than people in the church. And I said, I'm going to just let them know that you're a part of it. She says, would you do that? I can't get there. But let them know I'm a member of your church. Amen. Jackie, come Holy Spirit. You're a part of our church. Tell you what we're doing this morning. Joy, would you come? Joy is going to be anointed for her. You remember we've anointed Joy for healing? Joy is going to be anointed for Jackie this morning. Jackie, who you've never met, who has all those diseases. And uh, yeah. say hi to Jackie. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> love you. We're out of the box. We do love you, Jackie. We love you. I'm going to ask some of you to come. We're going to lay hands just as if Jackie was here. And if you'd come, and we're going to stop right now and anoint her with oil. Amen. 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 Keep coming. We've got all day here. Praise Jesus. Keep on coming. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You know the Holy Spirit is present with Jackie as she will watch this. And she will see your love. How many of you have faith for Jackie to have a touch from Jesus? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We anoint joy in the place of Jackie. Amen. Who would love to be here. I think of some of us who have a hard time getting here. She would love to be here, but cannot. But you're, she's our church out there. Jackie is our extended church, and there's many more like her. And this is a house of prayer. And I anoint joy, and I ask Jesus Christ that you would begin to move in Jackie's body. Amen. Bringing her a presence and a power and a grace. And a word from you. Yes. You can touch her and heal her, but you can begin to strengthen her in any moment. Yes. And Lord, I pray for grace. Yes. For grace for her to go through the days. But we are expecting a report that your faith has made you whole. Jesus, move. We ask this and we give you thanks in your precious name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Come Holy Spirit, we need you. Isn't it great to have joy who's been touched by the Lord stand in for someone else? <clears throat> Jesus is all about new. He's all about new, new vessels, and he won't mix old with new. Here's one of the problems. We want a little bit of my old life. I just like the, I like a little bit of the world, but a divided kingdom can't stand. He's looking for people that are totally sold out to him. That say, fill me, Lord. There's no room for the world in my life. And so he he won't mix. Isaiah 43, if I can get it quickly. I did. All right. Isaiah 43. Here's what he said in the Old Testament. 43, 18. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'm doing something new. So he says, listen, forget the old things. What does God want to do? Don't dwell on them. Because I'm not going to mix the two. I want to do something brand new. In your lives. Isaiah 42 9, he goes back, it's just a page back, and he ends up saying in 42 9, the past events have indeed happened. Now I declare new events. I announce them to you before they occur. So here is what I want. That is the inreach that we need. It is the inreach that we need, that we need to look and self-examine and say, God, what do you want to do? What has been mixed in my life that you want to get rid of? But then we need an outreach. An outreach, I want you to remember these three things because this is what's needed. There's an outreach that we need. 
after the Holy Spirit comes upon us and fills us, first of all, you can walk in victory. Do you hear me? You can have victory over sin. The Bible is full of it. You don't have to be conquered by sin. You can walk in victory. And then you can witness in power. Did you catch that? Walk in victory, witness in power, and win people to Jesus. So let me give you a little bit of a taste this morning of what's on my heart. Now in the old days, in the old days, I watched some programs, and I'm not knocking them. I'm not going to touch God anoints. But I watched programs that if you mailed in so much money, they would pray for you. Or we'll send you a handkerchief, and it's going to be an anointed handkerchief. But, you know, please send us money. But God has been laying on my heart all week. I shared it in Bible study. We had an amazing turnout for Bible <coughs> study. It was great. I mean, a great spirit there. We said it's like having church together except sitting around and being able to talk about it. Um, and you know what's unique right now in this church? We have a lot more men at that than we do women. A lot more. And hardly, usually you get women at a church and not men. And, and we had like 10 or 11 men and I, maybe 11 counting online and 2 or 3 women. And what a time. Right, Jen? What a time. But let me, let me tell you what's come to my heart. I don't, I don't know. It's 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 not it's not just some good idea. But it's on my heart. That we need to extend our influence out there further. There's a lot of ways we're gonna to need to do that. There was a man here last week. He can't be here because he runs a convenience store and he wanted to be here. He wanted to be there yesterday. He can't come because he can't get coverage or he'd be here. You know why he's here? He puts on his card. Here's what he put. How did you get, how did you hear of us? Word of mouth. Hmm. And then he said, Eddie invited me. Word of mouth. Hey. We have to witness. We have to witness in order to win, don't we? Open up our mouths everywhere we go. But here is what's on my heart. I want to get out there, and, and, and you may know situations like this. It isn't about people just attending. There may be somebody that needs prayer, and I want them to know that we will take a time of our service and not violating confidentiality. If somebody says, I need prayer, would your church pray for me, just like we did Jackie? We will, I don't care if it's a first initial, <coughs> leave out as much as possible, but we will make ourselves a house of prayer for people that are even out of state. Or all around us and they don't have to attend here to have our prayers because our goal is to build the kingdom but also there might be somebody somebody that just says I want to know Christ and we're going to say you know what we're going to pray for you in our next service for you to have an experience with Christ I, I feel like that's the heart of God I'm going to skip all the rest of my sermon today I'm going to skip it. It isn't, it, it, it isn't, it, it, if I need to come back to what I will. Because this is too, good ideas can be worked up by any church board or church members. Good ideas. You can come up with good ideas. But God's glory cannot be worked up here it comes now. Absolutely. Um, good ideas are the best that we could ever do, but God's glory is heaven's best, which do you want it? The best that we can do or the best that heaven can do? Can you imagine new wine? I will talk about it a little bit next week. We're going to get back into Pentecost and, and what happened with Jesus' life when the Spirit descended on him and what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? And it's no longer my activity, and it's not my ability, but it is all of the heaven that is advanced for me. I expect miracles this year. I'm getting too charismatic. You might have to fire me. <laughs> 